Uh, today um, about uh, a matter that comes up extensively when we're working with agent-based models. Um, we're, we're now well into the agent-based module of this course. Um, and there are some unique features of agent-based modeling uh, that uh, that require an adjustment to how we build the models. When I say how we build that, I don't mean the mechanics of how we drag things and, and build them up. I'm talking about how we plan for them, how we use them, the processes we use to deliver them to, to secure value from them. And um, in various semesters of this course, I've, I've actually omitted this material. Um, to sort of concentrate more on the, the technical features. We saw some of that last time. Last time I, I talked about state charts and I talked about how at one level they look very similar to and share some characteristics with stock and flow models, but how they have unique features. Um, features uh, that reflect their individual level formulation. The fact that we can capture processes of transition from one state to another that are not memoryless, that, that actually do care about how long someone has been in one state before they transition to another state. And we can capture many state charts that jointly indicate the, the state of a person um, or, or other agent. Um, and uh, this prevents a combinatorial blow up. That's really unpleasant and it's really awkward and it's error prone. Uh, within within models. Um, when we build models that are messy, just like we build software that's messy, messy, bugs live in that mess. Just like if you have a you know a space filled with trash, there's going to be mice, there's bound to be mice and rats living in it and cockroaches and all sorts of things. You, you can't see them, you can't can't work to, to 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 lessen them, prevent them from coming in. And so it is with software. You know, when we have software that's got a bunch of hairballs in it, a bunch of messes, bugs live there. Um, so it is with models. Um, it can be, as I said last time, full of sound and fury and signify very little. And, and just as when we build software, we strive for elegance, conciseness, clarity, separation of concern. So it is with models. But this time we're talk, going to be talking some about the model, modeling process. And um, I'm going to share my screen and, and walk you through some slides about this. Uh, oh, no, I don't want to end this. Uh, how do I press the big red button instead? OK, there we go. Um, so we want to go to this set of slides. And I'll, I'll post it to, to uh, the Canvas site. I didn't do this uh, previously. It's about model conceptualization. It's about building the right model, not merely building the model right. Um, so, so age-based models, is, as I've articulated, you know, seek to capture structure in the world through through this lens of agent-agent interaction and agent-environment interaction. We have these individual agents that are evolving. And often with agent-based modeling, one of the defining interests is how they interact with each other and how that gives rise to, to emergent behavior. Some people call them bottom-up models. I prefer to say upwards-facing models. Um, we specify often model at kind of a, a lower level and it bubbles up to emergent behavior or high level. So we see patterns emerge at a high level of the number of agents infected over time or the distribution of our space where agents are infected. Um, and, and those come from many, many interactions of agents uh, at a very micro level. Um, so we see meso or macro local phenomena um, that, that follow up from that. And so I like to call them upward space. Um, and they can vary from these very stylized models that capture just the bare essence of a situation. Um, to really ones that are, are richly grounded, like our models of COVID-19. 
Um, and we have talked about look how these monophase can involve one or more populations composed of individual agents in the in the model, each characterizing parameters. These are assumptions about those agents that don't change. Um, it may be something like their, you know, their ethnicity, or maybe something about, uh, you know, whether they were what was their birth weight, you know, at, at some point. Um, uh, their state, they have state. This is their evolving situation. Whether you know their current age or their smoking status, whether they're infected or not, etc. Um, it can also involve relational things like their networks to each other. Actions for changing that state and rules under which those apply, and that's a mode of interaction. And we have time horizons uh, in an in initial state. But this takes place in a, in a process. Um, and and agent-based modeling goes through this process shown here. And as is shown from these loops, it's an iterative process. We, we start early and we, we progress along here. Um, and often we go back. We re-examine things because models are learning tools, and we go back and we re-examine our assumptions because later stages maybe it just not calibrate properly, and so we go back and we go back to model formulation stage, or we go back to the um, to the model mapping stage, or what have you. Now, uh, with agent-based models. Um, uh, they have an amazing flexibility in general. Agent-based models stand out among the modeling processes we're talking about for having this kind of broad repertoire associated with them. Um, stock and flow models, you have limited grammar to describe stock and flow models. You have limited number of building blocks. You're kind of constrained by the nature of it to what you can describe effectively. With agent-based models, we have this amazing ability to put together arbitrarily rich structures. And this is an asset, but it's a liability. It's a, it's a risk as well. Um, it's very easy to add these deep levels of detail. You're not gonna, this is the risk. And, and you can get yourself spending massive amounts of time and adding it in ways that that shortchange your project. Does anyone know the term opportunity cost in here? What is an opportunity cost? Right? If I say there's a high opportunity cost associated with adding lots and lots of levels of detail for a model, what do I mean by that? Anyone remember? Yeah. Um, is it the name again? Oh, can I, can I, can I, yes, thanks. Um, is it the cost of choosing one option over another? Yeah, yeah. So the very fact that I choose one option means I'm not choosing another. In fact, I'm told, I'm no Latin scholar, but I'm told the word decide in, in uh, Latin comes from the root meaning to cut off. Um, just like you talk about insecticiding or you know, um, uh, adult deciding or infanticizing or, or what have you. Side means I think to cut off, and that's what I'm told. And and so you're cutting off certain other options by choosing one. You're not doing another, and um, therefore you have to balance that. When you choose to do one thing, you have to be conscious of the fact. That, look, I have limited time, I have limited budget, and if I'm going to go down this direction, I'm not going to go down that direction. So, you, you know, it's easy to add things, but what you don't see is what's the cost of adding them in terms of what that's excluding. Okay, that's an important, important notion of opportunity cost. And, and the issue is the flexibility of agent-based models is so great, you can just throw more and more things in there, add the kitchen sink without being clear what that cost is. You don't see the cost put in front of you, but it's there. And often it can take much longer to have that bring that model to, to deliver value than if you had gone down another road. So, you know, uh, when you're considering agent-based models, there's a lot of questions that you have to consider very carefully up front. What agent types do we involve? Um, you know, how are we going to characterize the person-to-person -person interaction? How much heterogeneity 
we want to capture. What do I mean by heterogeneity? Just as a sanity test. When I say heterogeneity, what am I talking about? Yes, Teresa. Yeah, yeah, the diversity of characteristics between things. And, you know, you can easily add into an, a person agent, you know, um, an age, a sex, a ethnicity, a hair color, a education level, an income level. You just go to town and just keep on adding these things and it can represent it. But if you really gained it, and what is the cost that it's not obvious. Um, uh, and, you know, with an agent-based model, it's this amazing ability to have the agents make decisions based on their local, local situation, what agents are doing around them, and based on decision rules that are very sophisticated, how they balance their choices, how they consider their preferences. And, and that's all great. And, you know, we have particular models where that's featured, but, but at what cost? And you've got to be constantly thinking like, what's the purpose of this model? Do I need this? Can I afford this? And is now, and critically, is now the, the reason for putting this in? Or is now the time to put this in, rather? Or should I wait until this is requested by the stakeholder? Can I defer this until we know whether it's important? Models here are like software development programs. Marisa will be familiar from last semester. Did some of my talk about this in the software development process. In the software development process, it's also easy to add things in. It's easy to add things in thinking, oh, that will make it cool. That will give us flexibility. It will let us do this or that. It will, it will, it will add value to the stakeholder. But often that ends up undermining the time you have to get the basics right um, and to really make a, a high quality uh, program and bring it to fruition at a smaller level, minimal viable product. Um, so, you know, here we, we have to exercise the same sort of restraint. Um, we have to exercise the same sort of caution. Um, and it reflects the high operating costs. Um, it's especially key to wield this logical mind. Uh, we did just a sec. I just want to make one point. Modeling is different from software engineering in this regard, in the sense that it involves one other thing that can really help serve as a logical mind. What is that thing? It's the fact that we learn from models. Models are learning tools. They surprise us. They we build this model, we think. Oh, we're going to need all this structure to explain some behavior we see in the world, like oscillations. Then we find, oh my God, you know, I just had these two things. I can see that. It'll explain that really interesting behavior by itself. I don't need those extra things. Sometimes we learn from, often we learn from models because the behavior is different than we think. It refines our thinking. And by refining our thinking, we may think we really don't need all that extra stuff. We'll go this other direction. We'll get more detailed about X and Y instead of putting it A, B, C, D, E all the way to Z. We'll just focus on these couple of areas. And with software engineering, that's less of a big issue. But as it turns out, though, there will be some overlaps in learning from the stakeholder. We'll talk about this. Yeah, Risa. I'm curious if there's sort of um, general signposts um, for when you're going to like put the class to be high, kind of. I kind of I understand where costs will like where where are we coming from, but I'm curious if there's ways to like evaluate prior to the term. Yeah. Beyond like what the stakeholder can have. Right. Um I um part part of it is the model differs so much from each other, it's a little bit hard to create a it is hard to create a general rubric. Um uh, what I'm gonna be advocating. Here is more that you build it up piece by piece in an agile fashion, and you do the minimal amount you have to 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 get to your next next objective, and and then you show it to someone and get your feedback off, and then you show it for feedback. And so it's it's not so much that you're sitting back and saying what does the bigger better model at the end have to include. And let's start on that and you work in the big bang sort of way all through the next three months and then you have it. It's more that 
you're constantly adding a little bit learning from it by observing the model behavior. Remember, that's not something we do so much with software. Like we, we add something to software, maybe that makes us think, oh, we see the user interface, and that makes us think, oh, that looks too clunky, and, and that's a bit of learning. But what's different with modeling is we get surprised by the behavior. We say, hmm, just those couple things can lead to this kind of curious behavior come up that I see in real world data. Wow, I didn't realize that. Maybe we don't need anything more. That's that's an influence of modeling. It's always teaching us lessons. And and so there, adding things in and observing is actually key to, to understanding where the phenomena comes from. If we just sit back and we add everything in in a kitchen sink sort of way, and then we see some weird behavior, we don't know where it came from. But if we add them in one by one, bit by bit by bit, then we know, oh, it was when I added that thing, that's when I started to see this weird behavior, good or weird, or good or bad. And that's really helpful. Um, it's kind of like when we add things in incrementally continuous integration with software development, we can see when a bug comes up, right? We, or we can see when an error comes up. And that clues us in when that there's probably a bug that was introduced recently. You know, it was probably one of these last few changes, right? Um, yeah. Uh, you don't have to talk about that. <laughs> um, enough said for now. Um, uh, big difference, by the way, both modeling and testing. Modeling world isn't woken up by and large the fact that they test models. And so you can only imagine what, what that means in terms of building flex models. Um, uh, so there's a principle in software development that some of you may have heard of. The principle is called Yagi. Yeah, you ain't gonna need it. And the idea is look, for training your enthusiasm, you know, um, recognize that there's a good chance that you may be motivated to put something in now. But you won't, in fact, need it at the end. And so hold back your enthusiasm, add things in one by one, get feedback on them, learn from them, and only add them in if your later confidence can be needed. We're going to see there's a process called sensitivity analysis that allows us to actually say, you know, how much does much if I add this little thing in, how much does it really make a difference? I can vary this new assumption and see does it totally change the model results or does it barely make a difference at all? And that can clue us in like, do we need to keep this? And if I think a tiny difference only, you know, it would take a lot of work. There we, we might not want to put it in the first place um, or you know, leave it out because. It's not going to be worth our time. And when you're dealing with nonlinear models, this happens a lot. You think this is going to be really important, but it's overwhelmed by other things. So, how many people in here think of three seven? Okay. Um, right now, okay. Um, that's it's a good course to take. Um, Doctor Cogos, right? Uh, Study Cogos, yeah. Um, great course and uh it teaches some important principles um but uh one thing you probably will have seen those who've taken 370 certainly 371 is this idea of agile software development can anyone say what what are some features of agile software development? i'm not, not asking you to to define it i'm just asking you you know what are what are some of the features of this anyone yeah and name again Alex, yeah. Incremental delivery is a key one. That's that's one of its defining features. And that allows it, why do we say, uh, I would say that allows it to be agile. Why is that? Yes, reason. I think that we impress the stakeholder and allow for feedback and allow That's right. That's so you're not developing for a year before you see the stakeholder and only you know, getting guidance. You're getting the guidance every week, or every two weeks, or every three weeks, depending on sprint time. And they can tell you, oh, you know, um, you know, that doesn't. Now I realize. Now you show it to me. I really need this. Or they'll say this thing changed. You know, in our business, and 
we need to add add this other thing, or I didn't think about it, but this thing is important. Or they'll say, that's great. The next big thing to add would be this. That's the next priority. And it allows you to always adapt to the situation, including a change of situation. And agile modeling is kind of similar. We're always adapting, but we're adapting to our learning and stakeholder feedback. We're adapting to what we learn from the model through sensitivity analysis, through running the model and seeing the patterns of the model, and we're getting feedback on those results. When we run it and the stakeholder sees it, we get feedback of does that look reasonable from the stakeholder. So all these things help us learn from the model. Right? Uh, I try not to, 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 to you know, I'm, I'm aware of hard drive sensitivity, so that's why I try to avoid students. Um, so agile modeling development um, provides uh, an avenue for constant learning and kind of refactoring the energy of developing the model. You build it up in a step-by-step -step fashion, you modify it in some small way, you learn what change did that make to the results of the model. And learning from that, you say, what's next? But often you get the stakeholder involved and you say, look at this. And, and they say, oh, man, that shows something that I've long been interested in. Let's go deeper on that. Because they didn't really think about it. Here's the thing. That we like to imagine ourselves as, um, as you know, rational actors that can think things all out well ahead of time. But often in software development, it isn't until we kind of stand in front of something, that we see something in front of us, like an app interface, or at least a mocked up one, that we really start to get a sense of our needs. And think about it, we're, we're computer scientists. We spend like our lives interacting with programs, including little with user interfaces of various sorts. And we actually have an advantage because we're constantly immersed in that and imagining what this could look like. We can more easily imagine what a user interface could look like if we were to, you know, uh, not think about it, we can more easily sketch it out. If you're a physician, or if you're a nutritionist, or if you're a you know, a criminal psychologist, or you're someone who specializes in banking. Yeah, like it's harder for you to envision what a what a user interface looks like, and you need to see it sometimes to really give informed understanding. That's what a lot of computer people don't understand. They think you can go and sort of ask what are your needs and and ask them verbally to imagine this, and they can imagine. No, often they need to see it. And that's why we do mockups. That's why we do storyboards. That's why we do um you know quick uh, spike card effects and demos and so on and software engineering in modeling there's a lot of things we don't understand about about what a model will look like until we can build it that's true but what's always the case or virtually always the case for any big thing in nonlinear model we don't know what it's behavior will be until we build it we have to build it to anticipate those models we built together in class remotely and so on. Um, I can kind of guess what the behavior looks like, but there's constant surprises, even though I've been working with those for decades. So, so with agile model development, you modify it and you observe that behavior and that clues you into your priorities. Um, and you know, often you're comparing what was the behavior before this change and after the change, and that clues you in if you might have a of a problem, right? Um, sometimes you disable the changes, like you turn up, you set the parameter to zero for like maybe your change is added waning of immunity. Remember that? Like remember waning of immunity loop? Um uh like to see more nodding heads in the rum, um, but not from lack of sleep. Here's an S I R model, right? Um maybe maybe the folks online can see this too. And maybe your change for this, this, this what happened, okay? In, in June 2020, we were working with Lalash Clearwater, Northern Saskatchewan, to fight the outbreak there. And someone asked, you know, what would the impact be 
in terms of um, the interventions that are being considered, in terms of the policies that are being considered here, what would the intervention be like if people could lose immunity? Would that change what the recommendations are? We said, oh, well, we could go out of that and check. And so you imagine extending a model so you have people lose immunity, right? Um, you could add this and then you could run the model and compare it with the earlier one. You could add this wedding to me. But often we add it and there's a parameter for like speed of waiting immunity, you know, uh, the rate with which immunity is lost per day. Maybe you set that to zero and you just make sure it's the same behavior as before. So you do kind of a sanity check. Is the behavior, if this is set to zero, in the same as before? If not, it would bug something. Um, but if it is, that accords with my understanding, and then I actually examine, you know, non zero values of it. Um, so this would be a uh, assumption of um, So these incremental versions are often demonstrated to stakeholders. We run them in front of them, we show them, we often build them with stakeholders online. And so incremental development here offers huge benefits. Um, those who have taken 371, this will be like you know, something you've seen before. Those who have taken 370 will probably recall this. But you know, for modeling, there's some twists. Um, you have a greater understanding where patterns come from. Like that weird behavior we see, where we saw a cycle, an oscillation, or where we see it you know, jump suddenly from this situation to that one, that only came in when I made a certain change. So um, we can, through incremental development, and I think bit by bit, get a feedback and learning from it, we can change direction at a time. That's what it's agile. We can get feedback from the stakeholders at these points um, and get a new prioritization. What to do next? What do we add in next? You can get greater clarity and prioritization. You can, because you're only adding bit by bit, you can cut it off at any point and say, that's enough. We've added enough. You know, uh, this is all the time we have to go with this this model. Um, right now, we will have to um, do the analysis for the next three to six months. You can find bugs more quickly because you've only changed one thing or two things between the versions. So you can, if you start seeing a bug, you can know, oh, it must have come in through this change, right? Um, and and you can get enhanced stakeholder confidence. If they're always seeing them all come along that's never advanced, you you develop confidence on their part that this is making progress. And it improves morale on of the whole team in good ways. Um so um why why might you um add things into the model? What might shape your understanding? Of what needs to go to the model. This, this slide was originally created for people from a different background, but it's it kind of makes sense. And one thing, I mean, like I'll try to translate it to you. One thing is, like, if you want to investigate certain what if questions, that's what this one is really about. Think about it the poll. It's really, if you want to ask certain what if questions, you need the ability to do that. Let's suppose you want to know. Maybe you have a model that is simulating the spread of HIV AIDS among, among um, uh, you know, people within uh, Saskatchewan. And you want to you want to investigate how much would it help to have a um, because a lot of it's spread by needle sharing, if we had, were to have a needle exchange and you know, give out free needles, or suppose we were to have you know um, free testing for HIV available. Uh, available for you know very readily through these kits that are distributed. If if we want to do that, we need some way of representing that in the model. How that has effects. So we need to represent needle sharing. We need to represent testing. I mean that's kind of a basic thing. But like if you want to ask the what if question, you need enough mechanisms in the model to represent the what if question. Um. So that will push you towards certain things being the model. If there's data that you want to compare the model result with, you want to put it into the model as assumptions, the model needs to have something comparable to that data. So it, it needs to have something that can be compared. 
Um, if there's kind of a theory in, in terms of how things work uh, in certain conflicts, you would need to be able to represent them the all. Um, and uh, if there's certain types of heterogeneity, you need to capture. In general, there's this, um, and I I have a, um, uh, I, I think a slide on this coming up. Um, there's a, a certain division that you can walk through to think through this as well. But one of the most basic things is something that I, I talked about at the very first substance class where I did a lot. And what is that thing? That thing um, is this division between, with respect to three, this, this is a division, uh, a classification. Of, of how much we represent certain factors in the model and in what way. And there's three divisions. One thing is things that are just ignored. They're, they're not in the model. We And often we consciously put these aside. There's a lot of things we don't think about, but there are certain things we think about and say not right now. That's not in the model. Another thing will be things that are in the model, but in a fixed way. We just put in an assumption, the contract rate. Is an example. We may say it's fixed. We, when I say fixed, I mean as a constant does. It doesn't change over time. Um, but then there are some things that are endogenous. What do I mean by an endogenous thing? I mentioned this before. Yes. Exactly. It's generated by the model. Exogenous things are things that are in the model, but we tell the model. And uh, endogenous things are things the model tells us. We, we, don't, we don't tell the model, do this, do that. It, it's telling us the number of infected people over time, right? Like that comes out of the model as a result of our assumption, right? In an SIR model, all we told it was the number of people to start with in the I stock, right? The, the number of people initially here. And after that, it evolves in its own way according to, to the model dynamics, right? That's an endogenous thing. The number of people infected, number recovered or is endogenous. S is endogenous here. Um, the number of people flying from here to here or here to here, waiting in the community, et cetera. Those are all endogenous factors. Um, but there are some exogenous factors like the rate with what, um, immunity wanes or the contact rate C or the chance for contact, of, for discordant contact of transmission data, uh, the, the mean length of time you spend infectious, et cetera. Um, I'll call it tau as I did in some slides. Uh, those are all uh, exogenous things. They're, they're in the model, but they're represented in a fixed way. Um, so, in an agent based model, it helps to, when you're thinking about what's in the model, to think through what are these divisions within the model. Um, you know, what, what are the divisions we see? Uh, you know, what, what's in what category? And don't be embarrassed that endogenous might smart, start small. Exogenous might start small, but a bit larger, and then ignore. Um, so, so why might you include something? What are the compelling reasons to include? I, I have that slide on it, but I think this one maybe is a little bit um, better to understand. Um, if you think you can't possibly capture the essential dynamics, the essential behavior you want to see, you want to put it in the model. Um, you want to put it all. Um, apparently, you know, there are certain things which you may say, look, you can't possibly capture this behavior we're trying to understand, explain, that we have to have in the model without this structure. Right? Um, so that's a motivation. Um, or you want to capture a certain type of interaction. We spoke about that earlier. Um, or you're concerned about how it will be affected by an intervention. You want to look at how an intervention may cause, maybe you're concerned about lockdowns that could lead to mental health issues, you know, worsening of depression because 
of the lockdown um, because of lack of social interaction. And you're concerned for older people, long term care, that if, um, you know, if, if there are visitor restrictions on the long term care facility, yes, it will lower the number of people that are getting affected, but it may also lead to loneliness among those who are, who are present. Uh, you know, um, um, a sense of uh, loss by those who are present because they can't see loved ones so among the residents. Um, so in that case, you, if, if you want to see how that's affected, um, you know, uh, this sense of uh, isolation by the residents of the facility, if that's a key goal to all, you want to represent it. Um, if, if you want to know something about you know how it affects people and lower income groups versus higher income groups. You need to affect affect that. Um, if you want to compare it to data, you you need something in the model that can be compared with data. And finally, if the state if there's a stakeholder who says I need to see that to have confidence in the model or to assess the model or I want to understand the model output. Um, I want to understand how the model is working by having this output. That's another reason you, you will represent things typically. Um, uh, okay. Um, so just be aware that um, representatives as end objects produced by the model, generated as we said earlier by, your name again? Dorian. Um, Motivation, motivation generated by the model is um, maybe maybe strong, but it does it, it, and it has some some benefits. Very robustness for changes sometimes to translate it to other contexts. You're not hard coding assumptions about it, etc. You have extra flexibility, but it can require more data and more work. Um, so it can it can impose costs. Now I want to talk about something that um, that is a real difference between models. It's really important that you realize that base based models, just like system dynamics models and discrete event and less discrete event models, often are built in two different areas and two different ways. There are some models that are like caricatures. Um, you folks will be familiar. Probably everyone here has seen political cartoons. Maybe you've seen a political cartoon of certain Canadian prime ministers, for Brian Malone, um, for example, which will exaggerate certain facial features. In it. Or you'll see Justin Trudeau depict, depicted in a cartoon, or you'll see, um, uh, I don't know, uh, maybe it will be, uh, uh, you know, uh, Andrew Scheer or what have you. Now, some some political figure, and you know it's a caricature, right? So it's not using a photo; it's not a perfect depiction. Instead, it brings out certain features that are recognizable, right? Um, so maybe Donald Trump's hair is orange, and it's like glowingly orange, right? And and that's um, that's not an actual depiction of what he looks like, but it brings out kind of a certain feature of the situation. But, and exaggerates it, right? And there's a set of models that are kind of like that. They just focus on one feature or a small number of features, and they're not meant to be an exact representation of the world anymore than, you know, a picture of Brian Mulroney's chin is meant to be a, um, a depiction of the world, uh, of, of this exact appearance. Um, uh, but these are what are called uh, theory building models. They, they help us think through the issues and how they contribute to the result. On the far side are what I like to call theory explication models, where you have a theory and it's pretty, pretty advanced theory already. You've kind of thought through how the system works and you just want to know, you know, like how will it behave with very particular assumptions on parameters. Um, so this is an example of a, of a stylized model. And for those who have any logic up, I'd invite you to follow along if you'd like to, uh, this model. Um, 
So this is called the Schelling segregation model. And it's, its name reflects two things. One was created by a Nobel Prize winner, Thomas Schell. Um, he, was a, he was a Nobel Prize winning uh, economist. Uh, and one of the things that he studied was the emergence and segregation. He was very interested in these distressing patterns whereby in major US cities, Detroit or LA or Los Angeles or, or Chicago or Boston or what have you, um, Atlanta, there would be these big areas that would be largely inhabited only by, and the two groups he was mostly looking at were, were, uh, were white and people of color. And they'd be in two different groups. Um, you know, big areas that would be to be very heavily just fun. And there's a lot of commentary on this, on reasons for this. And people had identified all sorts of discriminatory practices that could give rise to this. And there's literally a half a dozen to a dozen of these that I could probably list off. Um, discriminant, you know, discriminatory lending practices from businesses, residential steering, where a real estate agent you know, has an African American person seeking a home and they steer them towards the African American section because they assume they'll be more comfortable there or because they think they won't be welcome in the white, the white section of town. Or, you know, there may be disparities in income and that leads to them to live in different areas. There's many types of, of reasons that uh, sociologists have that identify that might be right for why we see these big patterns of segregation. But Thomas Schelling was, was not interested in just kind of laundry list of these things. He was wondering, you know, what we needed to explain this. Could this result from something simple? Yeah. Like um, small differences in preferences. So if you go to any logic here, and uh, I will do it on my computer, and you don't um, have to follow along, although you're you're welcome to uh, to do so here. Let's call up. Uh, no, 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 no. That's not the right one. Okay, um, here it is. Okay, sorry. Um, and you go up to help, um, and you go to example models, uh, and you can scroll down here, and you'll find a shelling segregation. Here you go. Okay. Shelling segregation. Um, and the shelling segregation model is on a board. You can see this kind of this board of, of uh, this grid, this set of grid, this grid set of grid sites. It's isolated into um, So we have this entire space and it's divided up to mutually exclusive collectively exhausted squares. Um, and a given square at any time is either empty or it's occupied by a red individual or a black individual. Those are the, the two colors we for no particular significance. And the idea is that over time, those individuals can either remain in that current position or they can move. They can choose to relocate. And what Charlie was looking at was what if they have a preference that's modest for where they relocate? What if they're interested in living with people who are who look more like them? What will what will happen to this world? Now Schelling um, formulated this question in the 1970s. In fact, he he first pursued it supposedly on an airplane um, with a uh, okay, he, I think it was first on an airplane that came up with the idea. Then he actually pursued it with a checkers board. So he had red and black checkers um, on this board, and he would move them around manually, you know, to simulate. But of course, these days we can do this so much faster with an H based model. So you notice up at the top of this is a preference to have neighbors of the same color. And you can dig in and find what this was. But basically, there's a Characterization, it's a boolean about whether someone is satisfied or not. And essentially in this model, which is a discrete time, discrete space model, um, these individuals uh, will evolve over time. And 
they'll calculate how many neighbors there are of the same color here. Um, and you can see it in kind of this property of person here. It's in this area called um, on before step here. And then, um, and then on step, they take that into account and they basically will, this is part of the code, you can see this example, part of the code, it wouldn't pass by 271, it's not passed. Um, uh, if they're not satisfied, um, it'll roll a hard, a dice, you know, with hard coded probability will turn it through. They will jump to a random other set um, and to the relocate. So the idea is what affects their satisfaction is how many people around them in their immediate vicinity uh, are of the same color. That was the idea. And that, that's what he came up, come up with. Um, and this get neighbors uh, factors is basically asking for their neighbors, how many of them are, are of that color. Um, okay, so uh, we have this, uh, we have this rule and now you can go and run it. And if you run it here, for example, you will find um, that there's this starting interface to learn about it. Um, you can see this uh, reference to it and we could start it running. And so here's our initial state. I paused it here, okay? Um, so here they have a preference of 75%. So if they have fewer, then 70% of neighbors who are their same color, they uh, don't want to move. Um, they won't be satisfied. And they'll move quite, quite, uh, they'll move with 30% chance each, each set. So, so we start with a random setup on the board. People are scattered around. And remember, the red and black are individuals, and in this uh, yellowish one represents those who are, who are, um, which are empty. So we'll run this. And what you'll see is that over time, it's evolving. People are moving and they're moving in line with their preferences. Um, and what you'll see is if you speed it up a bit, you know, what comes out of it is a little bit shocking, right? I mean, um, it's these large patterns of, of people of the same color um, that are formed. Um, red is tended to, to, you know, be next to red and black with next to black and these kind of boundaries between them. Now, the model didn't hard code this into it. It didn't say make a boundary like this shape, like that shape, like this all emerged from it, right? Um, but that's an aspect of emergence. It came from these preferences on people's part, um, these, these small preferences. And if you go and you, you alter the assumptions about this model, and I'm going to go back to kind of a, a, a normal speed here, go or start it kind of slow. And I'll, I'll go here and I'm gonna pull this down. Let's suppose they have, they're happy as long as there's, you know, 30, 30 percent of those around them um and you know we could run this forward and once again so what this is saying is um uh if as long as they have one other person around them essentially who is of the same color they'll be satisfied and here you see similar similar groupings come up but they're less than that they're less marked, they're less large scale. You see what I mean? Yeah. Um, this is a sign of um, that even modest preferences does lead to this assortment. This is not random. It's a, I mean, this is not just uniformly random splattered all over. There's orderliness to this that comes out of it, even very small preferences. Even if you know, they're happy as long as there's one person around them that looks similar. Um, that's, that's, that's enough preference of wanting people to look like them around them that it leads to these, these patterns, these sort of larger patterns. It doesn't take a lot of this 
kind of preference is this, this prejudice to, to sort of want to be with people like you to lead to these sizable patterns. And you know, you could alter these. Now, what's affecting this sum is the fact you can only have so few neighbors and so on. And if you put at very high levels, you've got people just constantly searching, never being happy because they're always next to, they're either when they move, you know, they're, they're, they're either moved from place they're not moved with, but then people come in and they move again. And it leads to, in this case, non non convergence. It does not settle down. Um, but you know you can get um, for for intermediate levels there um, some big big patterns here um, like this. So this is an example of a model that's a thought piece model. This is not depicting LA. It's not depicting you know Chicago. It's not depicting residential segregation in Detroit. It doesn't have residential steering. It doesn't have predatory loaning practices. It doesn't have you know, discrimination on, on uh, applications for housing assistance, et cetera. It doesn't have distinctions in income, but it points to a basic truth that even modest amounts of preferences to live like people near you can lead to these patterns of segregation that can be pretty profound because that next generation, if they grow up and they only were near people growing up who look like them, in those big areas, they might carry sort of prejudices that then be discrimination of, of, of very serious sorts in the next generation. And that could come from even modest preferences. So that's an example of a stylized model. It's a thought piece model. It builds theory. And oh yeah, just these few assumptions can lead to these patterns. It's a, it's a thinking tool. Right. Um, so that's uh, that's an example model like that, um, uh, a model of that of that sort. There's another one called Conway's Game of Life. Has anyone seen this? The Game of Life. Is that, that... Cool, cool. So um, can anyone say maybe uh, Marisa or, or anyone else? What what does this uh, involve? Um, the game of life, uh, we have again a, a grid square, a set of grid squares. This is what's called a cellular function. Um, we have a set of grid squares, and a given grid square uh, can either be empty or it can be occupied. In this case, there's only one sort of kind of possible organism that can live there. It's this, it's this red, red dot. And um, can you say anything? Do you remember anything, Larissa, about um, like uh, what happens in this game of life? Let's let's open it up while uh, while we discuss this here uh, in any logic. But game of life. Do you remember anything about like how that evolves? It's a dynamic model, so it evolves over time. How? Uh, okay, okay. So um, you've got some elements of it, and uh, I'm I'm just looking for this. It should be here. Let me let me just see life. Um, I, I I am probably just overlooking it in uh, in the order of life. A game of life. The game of life. It's under T. Um, okay. Um, here's the game of life, and this again this again is a cellular dominant. So the rule is actually, um, it, uh, Larissa has some, some components of it. Um, uh, the rule is uh, in a given square here. Um, if, uh, if there's an empty square, it can be colonized by a nearby living cell. We call them cells. Uh, so if there's a nearby cell, let's suppose you're dealing with this blank square right here. Um, this one that's sitting, uh, well, maybe maybe I'll, I'll do it, I'll, I'll, with malice of forethought, I'll do it with this one. This cell here, this here cell, um, will be colonized if it, under a certain condition, two way, if it has three neighbors exactly that are alive around the, the eight possible neighbors, the neighbors in the north, south, east, west, and northeast, north, northwest, 
of the stuff but if it has exactly three it will it will in fact uh there will be colonized and so there'll be one that grows um if it's already a living cell so that's the only condition under which these can be colonized um if it's a living cell already if it's one of these it will continue to live if it has either two or three neighbors but if it has four or more neighbors it will die uh because it's too proud and if it has one or zero neighbors it will die because it's not got enough social support so um that's the rule here and you know that's the rule for every step of this and each step it goes through and figures out what the next uh configuration board will be and then updates to that uh, based on each one what the neighbors are currently so if you run this uh, model you'll see evolution over time some of these uh some of these squares will get colonized by nearby things this square here would this get colonized in the next time step this one here would you get colonized? no why not that's right will this one get colonized this one right there this beautiful yes it will um it will get colonized because why because it has exactly how many neighbors three exactly um uh will this uh will this square this little cell survive no why not not enough social support that's right so you can you can go run this model and what you'll see is that died out right and you'll see some higher level structures here actually um so these things <laughs> these things have names um and uh these are called traffic lights um uh and some of these other structures include uh gliders this is i i can't remember this is a certain name for this structure it's a known structure and it turns into this this is a stable structure and these things attract and by the way i think you can you can kind of uh mutate these things um by like clicking on them and you can get it to evolve um so i just you know uh perturb that and it's evolving and uh and over time um you know it's going to to turn into uh quite a um quite a process there um and uh this will evolve now the game of life has a special place in computer science so this is a this is an agent-based model uh the agents are these squares they interact with other agents uh they're in one of two states the state evolves um uh, these patches and um and there's time flowing out this discrete space not continuous space here you have these squares you're either in this one or you're that one or you're that one etc and it's not just you're continuously wherever you are and sort of smoothly going across it and it's going to be it's discrete time there are these kind of steps um now this game of life is of great interest theoretically as well or there was it the person who invented um, this basic structure of phytoplankton is someone named, does anyone know who it is? Someone whose name you should not. Who is it? Anyone? Well, you would have encountered this name in other classes, I hope. But maybe it's, been there. it's close to Turing. It's right about that. It's right about that. Um, it's right about that era. It's someone called von Neumann. Does anyone know? Does that name ring a bell at all? Neumann? Von Neumann? Where did you, where might you have heard that before? Yeah, the architecture. He created the definition of the modern computer architecture. Now, he was a mathematician who was also famous as an economist and also famous as a physicist. Um, he was a polymath. Um, he, he also did in my mind some some quite horrible things uh advancing the u.s hydrogen bomb program um but uh he um defined these things called cellular automata and he was using them as models of computation so turing had the turing machine and von neumann had these sort of um 
automata uh, that, that we can find. In a Trento game of life, now I'm going to make an utterance that is of profound significance, but depending on what courses you have taken, it may not mean much to you. But I'll try to explain why some of you may understand. So any this is computational universal. Does anyone know what that means? Why say this is computational universal? So it turns out any computation you could do on that very computer, on your smartphone, on the world's biggest, fastest supercomputer, could be undertaken in the game of what? Um, this is a general purpose computation. And in fact, in the 1970s and 1980s, hackers figured out how to build computers in the game of life. Like they would actually construct NAND gates and OR gates, and they built up machines that could simulate programs, that could run programs in the game of life. Um, and they took advantage of that computational universality. So this game of life, um, attracted a lot of theoretical interest, but it also attracted interest of hobbyists and so on. And I'm told that in the 1970s, this particular program, the game of life, um, in its various you know, forms, occupied more computer time worldwide than any other software ever, you know, at that time. It was like the most demanding uh, computational uh, uh, piece of software uh, in terms of how much uh, people had built it. And they create various uh, ex uh, experiments with it to, to learn things about it and, and build these artificial worlds in it. So this is the, the game of life. This too is a, is a stylized model. This is not meant to exactly mirror some situation in the world, but it captures an essential feature that we can learn about. And we can learn principles here about, um, you know, how how uh, systems evolve in the discrete time and discrete space. It's a quite intriguing system, and it's a model of computation. So, this is another example of a simple, stylized agent-based model. Um, so, uh, I'm going to share my screen here again, and. I see there's a, a, there's a chat uh, question here. Um, no, I just want to know that they could what? Oh yeah, okay, yeah, thanks. Yeah, Larissa's uh, serving as the, uh, as, as the translator for, for me there. Okay, um, so, uh, so these are examples of, of uh, stylized models. They're kind of thought piece models. They help us think through what would the implication be? And um, you know, here we're representing something on the far side here. These are like caricature models. That's not a depiction. The Schelling segregation model is not a depiction of LA exactly. It's not tailored for Chicago or Detroit, but it captures an essential feature of those situations that is that carries over. It has generality. Um, uh okay um okay now uh, i want to um i want to comment a little bit uh i've asked you to watch some videos um on asia based models that i've created maybe some of you have watched more i've built up a simple asia based model and one thing i mentioned on the videos uh i want to expand on here a little bit um i like to talk about how stock and flow models are like hedgehog knowledge in the old Russian proper. Um, it knows just a few things and it knows it really, really well. The hedgehog knows how to curl up and defend itself with its paws. But it not? And it's, it's limited. By contrast, agent based modeling is like fox knowledge. It knows a lot of things a little bit. And, um, and it has a huge repertoire. It's it's very versatile. It's very wily in its in its its mechanisms. ABMs compared to the stock and flows that we're used to, we have just tons of different mechanisms in there. And when we build them up, we build it up into these pieces that are varied. We have a big alphabet. So we have parameters and events and 
and speak diagrams and we can custom update variables with custom code. We also have stocks and flows we can throw in for hundred balls, but we have populations, we can have agents created and agents disappear. We can have agents send messages to another to one another or directly change each other. We have multiple types of transitions in these networks and these networks by which agents communicate of various sorts. Um, we, they can be you know, connected to nearby agents, or they can be connected with what's called scale free way, as we'll talk about, or they can be connected randomly. Um, we can embed things in space, uh, either stylized space, sort of abstract space, like you saw with those grids, or it doesn't really represent a real space, or it could be in geography. It could be, you know, the province of Saskatchewan. Um, just before this, I mentioned I was um, I was giving a talk here for biology, and you know I was showing some some pictures from some of our models here. This is from you know an ABM model for Saskatchewan. This is our hybrid COVID nineteen hybrid model that's used for across all Saskatchewan. For each of these communities, it has long term care facilities and schools and workplaces and homes and demographics of the population of different ages and that's a geographic model um it's a model you know showing they're showing the geography um and you know people can move around move around on roads and find out you know resources go to the nearest uh, hospital or what have you uh, so you get a mobility movement patterns they can either move in a kind of way like that shelling segregation model where they jump from one place to another or they can move in a sort of more slow, even languorous way from one place to another. Um, you can have graphical interfaces that kind of visualize this in different ways over space, over, over time, and data output mechanisms, and you know, uh, stochastics that you have to think about the variability, and, and you deal with that in, in uh, some ways in calibration and such. Um, uh, so, you know, within this context, there are these things in computer science that come up of relevance. Um, the, the difference between synchronous and asynchronous communication or updates. Uh, does anyone have a sense of what synchronous update would mean? Yeah. Exactly. It's sort of atomic. They both get updated at the same time. The game of life we saw, that's synchronous. They're all updated in lockstep. All updated at once. Everyone kind of figures out how this cell is, uh, every cell figures out how it's going to evolve in the next time step based on current configuration. And then, boom, they all update. And then they all figure out how it's going to update in the next step. Boom, they all update. But meanwhile, um, we have asynchronous modes where Things are going on just at their natural times, and agents are communicating, and agents get sick, and agents appear and disappear at sort of natural times. We have both, both mechanisms. We have communication that can be synchronous, like I immediately change this, and you are asynchronous, like I send you a message, and you have to handle it later. Um, we can also have uh, issues of subtyping. Those of you who have taken two seven, I think everyone here will have taken two seven. It is a three row. And so you will have seen some classic at least, right? Um, uh, Java subclass, or one thing as a subclass of an operation, not that I want it. Um, but it means if you have a subclass, it's also a subtype that can be passed around as. So if you have an orange or some type of fruit, it can be passed around as a fruit. Or a student in your model is a subtype of person that can be treated. Anything where a person can be treated, a student can be used as a student is a person, right? We have subtyping relationships in these models. So physicians are persons, but they have these added characteristics, uh, for example, in the model. All of these go into agent-based modeling in a way they don't make an appearance and system dynamics modeling. Um, uh, now, 
you may be wondering, like all that stuff we learned that stops and floats, does that mean it's not useful here? No, it's tremendously useful. Agent-based models are upward-facing models. They're models that are used at a lower level um, that go beyond um, the high-level metrics which we see in most stop and flow models. Um, and stop and flow models, we you know, if we if we characterize them in an aggregate way, a high level way, we don't have that ability. It's like having big boxing gloves on. We don't have that ability to specify things at the micro level. But in agent-based modeling, we do. But we can always see things bubble up to the overall level. And in fact, when we're looking at these models and simulating them over time, let's suppose it's an agent-based model of like you. We're asked to watch in that, um, uh, in the context of your uh, of your videos that I watch, asked you to watch. I'm building up a model, uh, so maybe it's a model, for example, with people that can progress among these states. I could run this and simulate it over time, right? I have depictions of dynamics at an individual level. Um, that are going on, and I can ask questions about how many times a given person got infected. I could drill down to that level and see things about their history. This time a person has been infected one time, they're currently in the exposed state, they're a female, and they're located at this place here. And I could kind of go through that for each person in the population and all that's well and good, that's great. But I can also go up to this higher level and I can see how many people are infectious of, uh, over time. And what I will argue, what I will submit to you here is that these dynamics of the count of people infected, those are governed by stock and flow principles. Now, nowhere in this model will you find stocks and flows. You could spend all day looking at this model. There's an area of stock and flow. But I would say that this dynamics is governed by those same iron laws of inflow and outflow, of the fact that a stock rises if inflow is what compared to outflow. Stock will go up if the inflow is greater than the outflow. It'll go down if the outflow is greater than the inflow. Um, It'll stay the same if outflow equals inflow. That's governing this too. If we were to look at the number of people getting infected over time in this model, if we were to summarize that up by counting of people in a given week that get, get infected, and if we were to summarize the number in a certain week that, sorry, that get infect shots here, and the number in that same week that recover from infection, you would see that this is exactly governed by that as for those weeks where more people get infectious than recover, you will see this go up. For those weeks where more people recover than get infectious, the number of infectious people will go down. It's the same iron laws of stocks and flows. It's just there's no stock. There's no explicit reified stock. There's no, there's no stock object. Yeah, is a conceptual stock. What is that conceptual stock for that? Can anyone say? The conceptual stock being shown here is its very name is written on the lower left. Here. What is it? Yeah, it's the count of infectious people in the population. If we total up across the total population the count of people that are infectious, that is conceptually a stock. There is conceptually an inflow and there is conceptually an outflow. And so when we interpret this data, just like when we interpret data from the world about people in Saskatchewan, you know, who are in the hospital, and we can reason about inflow and outflow. People come into the hospital, they're being admitted, they're discharged from the hospital uh, live or tragically in some cases not live. Um, but we can reason about those stocks and flows as if they were stocks and flows. Um, it's not that the world has a, a, a stock that you can go visit for stock. It, 
the hospital population is a stock. This population in this model, the count of people infectious is a stock conceptually. So all those things you learned about infectious disease dynamics carry over quite well to this context. But we'll see there's some twist to it. We'll see that there's some extra texture to it, like for things like the basic introduction number, um, because we have some chance, you know, people chance of getting infected, for example, um, and it's it's stochastic. Um, um, and you know, the force of infection may be different for different people in the population, et cetera. But by and large, all that stuff. Uh, those principles you learn and stocks and about stocks and flows carry over and they offer great insight. So when you look at results from a nation based model, if you're building one for your project, be sure to look at it through the lens of stocks and flows. There won't be a stock there, there won't be a flow like shown as stock, but conceptually it's a stock that it has stocks and flows in it. And it's really helpful to be thinking in that stock and flow way. When you're looking at these counts from nature based models. Um, so, you know, uh, within age based models, we get a lot of insight from that. Um, I will say, though, we can do more with an age based model because we can look at things like the behavior over space, like where are the cities with high rates of COVID 19 infection or low rates. Or we could look at behavior over networks, right? What part of the network were infected and what part weren't, and what parts weren't, for example. And that's really useful. This one has never got infected. This this one has, has quite a few uh, susceptible people or what have you. We can look at different sorts of outcomes than we can within a, a traditional stock and flow um, context. Okay. Um, so we get patterns out that are patterns out over time only shown here for patterns of the space. This is from model chronic waste disease. And these are here dropping prions in the landscape, which can, can infect people. Um, and these are stochastic models, uh, as we said, and you can have embedding. So within this model here, each of these cities has itself, you know, things within it, agents within it. Okay, I'm going to let you go here. Um, uh, oh, somehow I uh, yes. Um, okay, um, so I think we'll 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 leave this for today. Um, I'm going to hold off this hour here, and I'd be glad to talk to people. Uh, if like to. Okay, if if people leave and they want to find me, uh, so I'm going to start holding off this hour. I'm happy to dialogue with people. If people all leave. Um, either immediately or after that, I'll go to my office, which is 254.4. It's kind of uh, uh, kind of up the stairs and that way around the corner, um, or you can go to the stairs over here, go up and it's right opposite the stairs, and you'll find me there. So uh, what I'm saying is, if you want to come back for office hours after a break, that's fine too. Um, but I'll be I'll, I'll move up to my office 254.4. Okay, that's all for today. Thank you very much. And office hours uh, is open.